this song they call Shove It Over and it's a line and rhythm pretty generally distributed all over Florida. It was sung to me by Charlie Jones on a railroad construction camp near Lakeland, Florida. When I get in the hill and noise, I'm going to spread the news about the Florida boys. Shove it over. Hey, 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 you can't you line it. Oh, shack a lack a lack a lack a lack a lack <clears throat> Can't you move it? Hey, 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 you can't you try? Eat him up, whiskers, or he won't shave. Eat him up, body lights, he won't bathe. Shove it over. Hey, 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 you can't you lie? I like to think oh, of Hurston as one who is sister to the blues women of the 1920s. Cheryl Wall. Um, Of course, there were black women writers, poets and novelists of the time, but they wrote out of mainly middle-class experiences and bourgeois settings. Hurston was very much heir to the same legacy that Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey inherited, and she was a traveling woman. She was also very much interested in exploring the vernacular speech and music of African Americans. And so when she talks about the juke as the most important place in America, the juke was also the place where blues singers practiced and refined their art. She was unafraid to go where she wanted to go. She's bold enough to come north in stages, as did many of the hundreds of thousands of black people who participated in the Great Migration. She was also bold enough to go back south at a time when few were following that particular path. But she recognized that there was something of value there, and she was audacious enough to claim it at a time when conventional wisdom had it that black people, particularly rural southern black people, did not speak proper English. Hurston argued, oh, you know, in fact, they had made or helped to shape the language that white people in the South spoke, that rather than being deficient verbally, they were exemplars of verbal expression and ingenuity and agility. Hurston's interest in chronicling and celebrating the lives of ordinary self-educated black folks in the South became the primary theme of her literary works. After graduating with a degree in English in 1928, Hurston was finally ready to launch her literary career. Her first book, Jonas Gordvine, was published in 1934. In our next segment, we explore how Hurston's early success as a writer challenged the political and cultural designs of the Harlem Renaissance, and how those who had encouraged her unique literary talent would come to resist the image of the black rural Southerner. I'm Vanessa Williams, and you're listening to The Life and Times of Zora Neale Hurston from Public Radio International. Our guest today is Zora Neale Hurston, H-U-R-S-T-O-N. Isn't it true that when we're little, we just think the world revolves around us? Yes. Things are going to happen to other people, bad yes. things. Yes. But they aren't going to happen to us. Yes. No, sir. And, and that thing you said about the moon following you, tell about yes. that. Well, ha- uh, if you go outdoors tonight and the moon is up, I forget just what state the moon is in right now, but anyhow, if the moon is, is shining, 
you go out and you run, and it'll follow you. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I thought it made a special effort to just keep up with me. <laughs> and, uh, and I was so shocked when I found out it followed other people because I felt just I was something very special. And uh, so it was rain, so the moon would follow me. When every chair way I run, the moon would follow me, just like a puppy dog. And uh, it's sort of disillusioning when I found out other people making the same claim on the moon <laughs> as me. And I, did, I still didn't quite believe it. I still didn't see I could go with them and go with me, too, when I'm going another direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. your cousin disillusioned you, wasn't it? Yes, claiming, <laughs> making claims on the moon and everything, you know, when I felt I had it all sewed up, you know, and everything to go my way. That was an interview segment from the early 40s with Mary Margaret McBride on WEAF Radio. As a child growing up in Eatonville, Florida, Zora Neale Hurston had every reason to feel special. The all-black historic town had afforded her a lifestyle and culture unlike any of those experienced by the other personalities associated with the Harlem Renaissance. Eatonville, as Hurston says in her autobiography, was not the black backside of a white town. For her, the town provided an atypical view of the racially charged and segregated South. Valerie Boyd. What was amazing about Eatonville, especially for Zora Neale Hurston growing up there at the early part of the 20th century, was that it was a place where she was really sheltered from racism and never indoctrinated in inferiority. So it was a wonderful place for her to grow up because she saw examples of black achievement all around her. The mayor was black, the town council members were black, the store owners were black. So she saw all these examples of achievement and all these examples of what she could do or be. So she grew up in Eatonville feeling her own limitless potential and feeling that she could do or be whatever she wanted to do or be. That was rare for a black child growing up in the early 1900s. By writing and publishing highly unsanitized depictions of rural Southern blacks in her books and folklore collections, Hurston glamorized the Southern identity, using artistic elements and symbols political figures like Alan Locke and others sought to abandon. She was a product of the South, a woman disinterested in adhering to the political agenda of the time, and a writer and anthropologist dedicated to preserving and presenting the folk lives of the people who inspired her, the men and women she grew up listening to. While Hurston attained critical success, receiving rave reviews from the white reviewers, she received stinging criticisms from those within the black academic and literary community, and she became the symbol of the kind of cultural stagnation Harlem Renaissance elders resented. Hurston scholar Carla Kaplan asserts that it was Hurston's association with this counterculture that both attributed to the rapid decline in her status among her contemporaries and set off the campaign by political strong arms to relegate her to the perimeters of the movement. This was a risky move aesthetically, and it was a risky move politically because it ran afoul of the main aesthetic and political tenets of the Harlem Renaissance. Most of her contemporaries, which is to say also most of her dear friends in the Harlem Renaissance, were absolutely dedicated to the notion that the literary arts were the signal most important way that blacks could achieve civil rights and that they would do so by showing white America that blacks were really no different which meant that the theater and the fiction that was considered most important in the Harlem Renaissance were those cultural representations that showed blacks looking like mainstream ideas of white culture, which is to say northern, urban, middle-class, professional blacks. Hurston wanted to do something altogether different. She wanted to show white and indeed black culture a group of black Americans they had probably never heard of. So she wanted to go down into the deep south, into the sub-working class, and document the lives of what she called the Negro farthest down. On 
On April 18, 1934, Hurston wrote to Islanda Robeson, wife of political activist Paul Robeson, in response to criticism directed at her work, saying, I try to be natural and not pander to the folks that expect a clown and a villain in every Negro. Neither did I want to pander to those race people who see nothing but perfection in all of us. Hurston's descending rank among the so-called race people was undeniably due to her radical independence and her continued embrace of cultural artifacts they sought to abandon. Yet she seemed impervious to the political climate that swirled around her, refusing to respond, at least artistically, to the barrage of harsh criticism directed at her. Her novels continued. A year later came the first compilation of African-American folktales collected and published by an African-American, Mules and Men, followed two years later by Tell My Horse, a groundbreaking study of voodoo culled from Hurston's research in Haiti. Criticism among her contemporaries was unrelenting and followed each of her seven books. In 1937, Hurston released her most well-known and celebrated novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, which chronicles a semi-autobiographical and self-actualizing protagonist named Janie. A woman who, like Hurston, embarks on a journey in search of self-fulfillment, despite the pressures from opposing forces to conform. It was a spring afternoon in West Florida. Janie had spent most of the day under a blossoming pear tree in the backyard. She had been spending every minute that she could steal from her chores under that tree for the last three days. That was to say ever since the first tiny bloom had opened. It had called her to come and gaze on a mystery. From barren brown stems to glistening leaf buds, from the leaf buds to snowy virginity of bloom, it stirred her tremendously. How? Why? It was like a flute song forgotten in another existence and remembered again. What? How? Why? This singing she heard that had nothing to do with her ears. The rose of the world was breathing out smell. It followed her through all her waking moments and caressed her in her sleep. It connected itself with other vaguely felt matters that had struck her outside observation and buried themselves in her flesh. Now they emerged and quested about her consciousness. Lucille Tompkins, writing in the New York Times book review, described the writing simply as beautiful. However, Hurston's black contemporaries once again provided the harshest criticism. Richard Wright, who had achieved moderate literary success as a protest writer and had grown up the grandson of slaves in Mississippi, could not come to terms with Hurston's racial ambivalence and pastel portrayals of rustic blacks. He wrote in his review of the novel in New Masses. Miss Hurston seems to have no desire whatsoever to move in the direction of serious fiction. She can write, but her prose is cloaked in that facile sensuality that has dogged Negro expression since the days of Phyllis Wheatley. Miss Hurston voluntarily continues in her novel the tradition which was forced upon the Negro in the theater. That is the minstrel technique that makes the white folks laugh. 